In the book of Leviticus, chapter 8, and verse 23, we have a passage where Moses and Aaron uh, are to bring the priests, those who want to be in the ministry, and they have a, a rite of consecration which is given. And in verse 23, they are to do this. Uh, they took uh, the lamb, a ram of consecration. Aaron and his sons laid their hands upon the head of this ram, and they slew it. And Moses took of the blood of this ram and put it upon three places in these people who were training for the ministry. They were marked with blood in three places. So if you want a title for this, you can call it this. It's got a, kind of a long title. Blood on the ear. Blood on the hand and blood on the foot, because that's where they put it. He brought Aaron's sons, Moses took the blood, put the blood on the tip of their right ear, and upon the thumbs of their right hands, and the great, and the great toes of their right foot, feet. And Moses sprinkled the blood upon the altar round about. Now, when God anoints us for ministry, if you want to be a Christian and you really want to serve God and be used of Him, then you need the blood applied. Here's how it applies to our door. This is blood on our door. First on the ear. These three parts of the body are object lessons which will help you day by day to remember what it means to give your life to God. The ear the scripture speaks many, many times about the hearing heart. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear, Jesus said so many times. In Isaiah 55, 3, hear and your soul shall live. Uh, Isaiah 55, 3, Amos 8, 11, there will come a time when there is a famine of hearing of the word of God. Now, uh, the Bible warns us against being dull of hearing. Hebrews 5.11, seeing you become dull of hearing. Uh, blood on the ear has to deal, has to do with a hearing heart. And a hearing heart comes from a clean conscience. You will never get clear guidance with a dirty conscience. And the key principle, which you've already looked at in the counterfeit conversion series a little bit, is honesty. That's how you get uh, the first step to getting a hearing heart is absolute honesty with God, becoming honest. That's probably the most difficult part of the whole thing, is getting honest with God. And the only person who can make you honest with Him is the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit's task or ministry to convince of sin, to convict of sin. And we want to give you how that works. First, a warning. You cannot come to Christ anytime you want to. We tell people so often, hey, you can come anytime you want to. Baloney, you cannot come anytime you want to. You can only come when the Holy Spirit deals with you. And the reason why that is, is not some mystical thing. It's just that we get so, we are so self-centered and so steeped in our own things. The Bible says, can a leopard change his spots? Or the Ethiopian his skin? So do good, you that are accustomed to do evil. And you know all these ba the battles people have with, it's, uh, Finney mentioned in one of his stories how a farmer, used to ride an iron-rimmed cart to market. He did it all of his adult life. And when he first started off as a young farmer, on this long trip, two-hour trip to town to carry all of his stuff to market, he had to guide the, guide the um, horse through the thing. But after years, he wore ruts in the road, an actual groove. So all he had to do is get on, drop the thing in the rut and go to sleep. And when he bumped out at the other end, he was at the market. Now, sin is like that. You do wrong, and it becomes easier to do wrong. You do a little bit of wrong, and it becomes easier to do a large wrong. And it 
it, what you would never even think of doing when you first started doing, finally you can do without even bothering. And when you've worn ruts in your life like that, you cannot pull yourself out any more than you can lift yourself up by pulling on your bootstrap. Can't do it. It requires power of a higher order and an investment of wisdom of a higher order than you. If you that's that second law of thermodynamics thing, that entropy that I mentioned in the, in the creation evolution track. You cannot come. Uh, Jeremy Rifkin, I've got a new book of his, I'm just um, evaluating the moment, called Algin. He's not a Christian man. He's a man who profoundly understands some biblical principles. And uh, entropy, simply the measure of disorder in a system, that, and one of the corollaries of it is you can't get out of something, every, you can't get out of a system all that's in there. If you want to bring order into a system, you have to bring... It will always bring greater disorder somewhere else. And that applied in the moral life, it simply means this. If you try selfishly to get your act together, in getting this part together, it will fall apart in four other directions. And the only way you can overcome that and bring order out of disorder, even in our physical systems, is to put into that system a higher order of energy and greater um, ordering intelligence than the system you're trying to reorder. In other words, to get a plate clean, you have to put energy in the plate. That's the person, that's work. Then <clears throat> you have to be smarter than the plate. See? So the only way you can get out of the mess you've got yourself into is not by trying to get your act together, because it'll fall apart four other directions. And that's to call out to somebody bigger than you. And if he doesn't help you, you're in trouble. Now, we, we believe that people have choice, but, you know, freedom of choice is a limited choice. It's not an ultimate freedom. It's not ab absolute autonomy. You have so much freedom. You have freedom, for instance, to choose whose slave you're going to be, but not whether you're going to be a slave or not. If you will not be a slave of Jesus, you'll be a slave of sin. And a little book just found in the bookstore called How to Be Your Own Selfish Pig. <laughs> best title of a book I've seen in 10 years. There's a, uh, not a great title, How to Be Your Own Selfish Pig. Uh, there's a, a, a line from a, from, a, from a song, Christian Jesus music band. Uh, I'm a, yeah, I'm a, they, they say that I'm a Jesus freak and perhaps I am. Whose freak are you? So you will be a slave. If not of Jesus, you'll be a slave of your own lusts. You can do it, no choice as to whether you'll be a slave or not. You don't have a choice as to whose master ultimately you will be, you, you will have. And that's either Christ or not. So don't tell people you can come anytime you want. It's not true. You can only come when the Holy Ghost deals with you. You grieve him away and you're sunk. Immediately, I have to say this, because I have 50 people come up. I think that's, I've done it. It's me. I grieved away God. The Holy, I've committed the unpardonable sin. Let me tell you this. If you feel convicted, you have not done that. Because it is He who convicts. I'll tell you what the unpardonable sin looks like. And I think I've met some people who have done it. They have no interest in the things of God. They care a brass rose about anything. They don't think about God. They don't worry about Him. They are not concerned about their sin. They're not concerned about anything. And it's like that for a long, long time. It never changes. And not just ordinary sinners. They're people who have seen truth, turned their back on it. Now there's no desire or interest anymore. Now that is an exception. That's bad news. But the majority, I'd say almost every person I've ever met who thinks they've committed the unpardonable sin have not. But you know what it is? It is to grieve away the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' day, it was attributing the work of the Holy Spirit doing the miraculous to convince the Pharisees that Christ was really who he claimed to be. And they could not deny the reality of the miracle. They knew it was supernatural, but they did not want to admit that Jesus was the Messiah. So they said, this is demonic. And it was to attribute the work of the convicting work of the Holy Spirit designed to bring them by absolute demonstration of the reality of God to, to bring them to allegiance to Christ and 
not wishing to face those consequences, attributing his work to an unclean spirit. Jesus said, you can be forgiven all manner of sin, but if you blaspheme against him, you are had it. And that is true. Finney used to preach in place and tell him, you must repent now. And he'd go down the road, and he would say to another group of people, you think you can come any time you want to? And one guy who followed him freaked out. He heard him preach in one church, said, you come any time, <laughs> you know, obey now while God, see, and then next church he heard him say, you think you can come any time you want to? And he said afterwards, what, you know, what is this? But you see, one group of people are just fatalists. They're sitting there, if God wants to use me, he knows my number. You know, uh, any time he wants to reveal himself to me in any special way, I'll get saved. And completely denying responsibility. Another group of people are basically humanists, sitting there, hey, you know, we can do, we can fool around, and we can always turn the song, he'll always say, I forgive, baloney. There comes a time when you can grieve him away. Hearing heart. Now, uh, scripture says, Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The thing we, we want to, uh, tons of scripture, John 8, 47, he that is of God hears God's words. My sheep hear my voice and I know them, that hearing her. Uh, he that hears my words and believes on him that sent me shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death to life. Now, here's the key part on this honesty thing. Uh, I, we can call it a divine audit. And nobody likes the IRS. They're probably the Antichrist, you know, but the, an audit, that's a scary thing. You are going to be audited, signed, your local Antichrist. Uh, <laughs> an audit is, uh, you know, where they call all of your books in and go through everything you've ever done for the till since you were one you know it's that thing a divine audit is uh, how do you get honest first step to repentance which leads to a clean conscience the other thing this is the Perry Mason illustration how many have you seen Perry Mason at one stage or another. You know, I mean, not the real, you know, not Raymond Burr himself, but I witnessed him once in PG, Raymond Burr. Told him the best thing he ever did was the Psalms. <laughs> Late night TV buffs would know about the Psalms. He did a whole series of Psalms, reading them and with neat stuff. Anyway, here is what a Perry Mason episode looks like. If you have not seen one, you only have to see one and that's it. All of them are exactly the same, only the names are changed to protect the program. Uh, in it, somebody is usually killed. It starts off with, you know, robbery or something, but somebody usually dies. And it just looks like the girl that Perry Mason has to defend, it's usually a girl, uh, sometimes a man, but is obviously guilty. That's, the DA, who has never won a case in the entire series, it must be embarrassing to be a DA. <laughs> Always has absolute convincing evidence that it was Perry Mason's client who did it. But Perry Mason has his detective friend who died of lung cancer. And they, the first half of the thing, they explore the evidence and Always the DA comes up with this extra piece of evidence that just puts a clincher on it. Perry Mason's always shocked. Uh, then it goes to the courtroom. They cross-examine a bunch of different witnesses. The DA keeps building his case. It looks like curtains. Perry Mason's clients go into the electric chair in the next 15 seconds after the commercial. It's just really bad. Then the guy who died of lung cancer, Paul, comes in with a piece of paper. He talks to Perry Mason. Nobody ever hears what he says. Perry Mason thereupon goes to the judge and asks for a recess. There is a break for a Coke commercial which adds life. <laughs> then we are returned to the courtroom in the last 15 minutes. <laughs> in this last 15 minutes, Perry Mason recalls somebody to the stand. All right, I want to recall so-and-so to the stand. 
So back comes this person who escaped unscathed, completely innocent before. Then Mason cross-examines him. He says, always like this, you stated that on the night, yes, the person says, I was there. And you also stated that at this particular hour, yes, the person, I already said that. But isn't it true, Perry Mason says, that on that night, just before you went in there, you also went into this room, the guy goes, and then he goes, and didn't you also, and the guy goes, and then he goes, and wasn't it true? And then the guy stands up and he goes, yes, yes, and I didn't do it, he did. And then the camera goes, you know, and the person stands up and he goes, yes, I did it, I hated him, I, you know, and that's it, that's the end of the, so anyway, You've never seen Perry Mason. That's it. That's the whole thing right there. Now, Perry Mason's process is what the Holy Spirit does in the spiritual world. There is a Bible verse that says this. When he, the Holy Ghost, has come, that's what we, he will convince the world of sin, of righteousness and judgment. Last time I mentioned what it means to convince of righteousness. But to convince of sin, this is a legal word. It is the word we translate sometimes convict. And what is convict? How do you have conviction? People trying to get clean conscience, get honest with God, usually do the exact wrong thing. They try to get on their knees and feel bad. That's what they try to do. They get down and go, mm. You know, and all you get is a double hernia out of that. It will not bring conviction. The Bible word convict is a Perry Mason type word. And what it means is this, to sum up all the evidence, fact by fact, and to present it before the mind. And you are designed like this. You cannot command emotion. Say, feel sad, feel happy. You're going, hey, oh, see? The only way you can do that is to, by choice, conjure up some image that's sad, you know, or happy, and then make, with the, the thought passing through the mind, that's method acting, you know. You, <laughs> you get into the situation, you see that, and then the feelings come out of it. But most people trying to get proper conviction over their sin and deep repentance. They do all the wrong things. They get down and try to command feelings. You can't do that. The way to do it is to let the Holy Spirit, who is the best lawyer in the universe, fact by fact present to you your departures from obedience to the living God. <coughs> and the best way I know to do that is maybe get a sheet of paper. Get along with God. And you don't do this every day. But Finney said, a weird thing. He said, Christians need to be frequently reconverted. Now, what did he mean by that? He meant that you, you go out and you get your, your heart gets hard, your hearing gets dull, and you need to, when it gets like that for you, and there's no breakthroughs, and what I'm saying, you know this wrong things in your life, not just, you know, the Lord hasn't spoken to you in a voice since yesterday, not just that, but when, when you realize this, I'm I'm losing something along the way. You need to get a, a divine audit. Uh, R.A. Tari said, keep short accounts with God. And what you do, get a sheet of paper, um, Bible if you need to, but it's not a Bible study. You just get on your knees and you, ask, you pray this simple prayer. Holy Ghost, show me what I have done to hurt not only myself and others, but most of all to hurt you, to grieve you. And then fact by fact, God will bring circumstances, situations, things vividly before your mind. And you can't handle that for very long without the proper feelings arising in your life. That is how you get convicted of sin. When I mentioned those early Christians, those uh, the world changers, they had a specific preaching on sin. That's what I mean. They, in God, had the ability to to fact by fact lay out before the mind the departures from God. Any ministry with a prophetic edge in it has that ability to practically lay out before people's minds their departure from the living God. And that must be preached if we're going to see conviction. When a person has had that um, honesty with God, that honesty comes, you realize I'm 
my God, I'm worse than I ever thought I was, see? That is the first step to a clean conscience. Neat thing. All right? That's that. And uh, second, and really fast. Don't, I've took a bit more time on that one, but... The, that was blood on the ear. Second one is blood on the hand. Now, what is the hand? The ear, what you hear with. What is the hand a symbol of? What, what do you do with hands? Action. The action. The, the hand is a, is a symbol of the actions of our lives. It is the expression of what we are. Now, I am part French in my grandmother's side. And if you cut my hands off, I don't think I could talk anymore. Do you know what I mean? I have to. <laughs> this is part of the speech for me. I don't, I don't know how to talk like that. That's why I, ha I have to have a throat mic. If I have to carry something, it's like I'm, I'm stuttering or something. I, what is this thing in my... And the hand, blood on the hand, speaks of cleansed actions. Now, there are practical things the scripture speaks, not the hearers of the law are just, but the doers. Be ye doers of the word, not hearers only. We've already mentioned that. Perhaps the hand and the eye are the costliest parts of the body to lose. Our friend next to a neighbor back in New Zealand had one of these little dumb power saws, you know, that, that eat up more hands than probably anything else. And, he, you know, he's a pretty good carpenter and stuff, but I think he, the, he tripped over the cable or something and the thing flipped back and just soared this part of us, like this. And there is his, you know, just this. So he really lost his thumb and that finger. And it, having th three fingers like that is a, you cannot believe what happens if you lose your thumb. You know, th this is one of the most incredible inventions God ever made. You know, it patented for man and designed a few monkeys and stuff with the same. But the opposed thumb is an incredible thing. And the blood went on the thumb. See, that's the key to the action. Now, the scripture says that it is the hands that commit most of the motions of sin, the carrying out of actions of sin. The scriptures speak about cleanse your hands, ye sinners. And when you think about it, the hands roll joints and light cigarettes and pop pills and shoot needles and turn the pages on dirty magazines and pet and fondle and masturbate and cheat on tests and shoplift and punch and express rage by slapping or hitting. Hands do that. Who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord? Psalm 24, 4. And who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart. You know, the funny thing happened to me many years ago a little illustration of God. I had to play in a tennis tournament. You seen Charity of Fire? It's on video now. I'm going to give it a video. I have a conviction about sport on the Lord's Day. I don't play sport on the Lord's Day. I've always had it. And back, back in New Zealand, we had these tennis tournaments for a club tennis. And they always played the finals on the Sunday. It was the day everybody got off. And Saturday were the semifinals, Sunday were finals. And I, I played in that thing the year before I got into the semifinals, and the thing was on Sunday. And I asked them if they could change the day. They said, no, it's always played on Sunday. So I thought, well, I'm going to have one more crack. I went in the following year, and this time was a very strong field of people. And uh, I said to the Lord, I would really, I forgot, I didn't tell him why. I need to, I need to witness, I need to tell him, look, I'm going to do this again, I'd like you to change the day, but if not, I'm going to tell you why. And I wanted to, 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 to talk to them about honoring God in practical ways. And, uh, you know, an unsaved tennis team, other all, you know, and this, anyway. Got up that morning, and I was going to Bible read. 
reading. Just, you know, nervous. And I open the thing up, and, and it's, it's in Job. And it says, <laughs> it's a wild scripture. Um, it talked about uh, he that hath clean hands, the righteous, it said, shall hold on to his way. And he that hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. And it was a weird... I went up, I have three or four tennis rackets. One of them, the racket I use mostly, has had a row of black tape on the bottom of it. When you played with it, the bottom half of your hand got black. The other one is one I had not used very much. It was a looser strung racket, but it had a cloth grip on it. And when you played, it actually, dirt from your hand came off on the towel on this thing. So I went out, I washed my hands, and I took this loose racket with me down to the, the court instead of my other more tightly strung one. I played, first, you know, first guy I played was simple. Second guy was a club champion, number one guy. In the second round, all right, and I, everybody said this is going to be a short game. My problem was that I could never, I'd do great first set, second set, if it went to three sets, I didn't have the energy to hold on. And when I got out, this guy had a brand new racket. He was, he's, he had just come back from Hawaii, was all bronzed and ready to, you know, one of these kind of, I came trailing out there with my little <laughs> old racket. And I beat him six, two, six, three, six, four, straight set. And what happened, he had a, his racket was newly strung, see. And because I didn't have a tight racket, I couldn't play net and stuff. I had to play a long, loopy game, and everything he hit, he overhit, and it went all over. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, every time I've ever played for you, you don't play like this. Why don't you play like that? And he asked me. So I told him. I said, this morning, as I was reading my Bible, <laughs> see, I made it through to the semifinals. And then they said, you be here tomorrow. I said, no, and let me tell you why. And I told them about this conviction. If not, I said, this is a day I set aside for the worship of the Lord. I don't do it. And the first time in the history of the club, they changed the championships and played on a Monday. So that was the only thing I needed to do, was get that little witness in. Clean hands. What do you do with your hands, all right? If those hands have been used for wrong, this is how you take revenge on sin. You take the same hands, and you use them to take revenge on whatever you did before. You get, if you smoke, you get cigarettes, and go, rup, 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 you know, and shred them. You get your drugs, you flush them down the john. You do things. You get your nasty posters and rip them up. You get all your clothes that you're not supposed to be wearing and make bonfires them. You take your rotten records and make frisbees out of them. You do all kinds of neat <laughs> things with your hands. One friend of mine who was addicted to pornography, years ago when he got saved, he got, uh, bought a magazine from this pornographic place that he used to go to. He went back into the store having bought it. And he said, uh, this is my magazine, right? I paid for it, right? The guy said, yeah. He said, I can do anything I want with it, right? And the guy said, yeah. And he said, good. And he ripped <laughs> tear, shred, made confetti out of it, threw it down the counter. And he said, it's junk like this. It's sending kids like me to hell. And that's called cleansed hands. Getting, taking revenge on sin with these things. You can write letters and apologize with these hands. You can pick up a phone and make a call to somebody you've hurt. This Hands. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands. See, it's the hands. It's a practical thing. Then. So tell young Christians, go do this. Go do something with your hands. L get blood on your hands. Go out and take the same hands. The scripture, there's parallels to this, by the way. Remember the scripture, if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off better for you that you go into, you say, well, no, no, you cut my hand off. God said, it'd be better if you lost your hand than go to hell with all of your members. And if you think it's bad to lose your hand, what is it like to lose your soul? The parallels in this thing, both in salvation 
there's parallels in power. The hearing of the word of God is power, and the transmission of power comes from the hand, the laying on of hands. God puts his hand on people's life. There's parallels in the authority area on this. You hear from God, you have authority in your speaking. See? You have God touch you by the Holy Spirit, and you have power in your actions. And the last one, and with this we quit. The, where does the blood come last? Blood on the foot. It's on the big toe. Somebody told me something really interesting about the big toe a couple of weeks ago. I never knew before. Because uh, he lost his big toe. He said, you know what the big toe does? It balances you. It is a balanced thing. And it's very important. You can't walk properly. You can't walk straight if they cut your toe off. Big toe, it's a balance. It's like that little bone there they used to think was a tail, a coccyx. Evolution said, well, that's, you know, when your tail shrunk as a monkey. That They said, it's a vestigial organ. You don't need it. Till somebody had to get it cut off, and they couldn't sit down anymore. It's a balance bone. <laughs> well, though, it's not a monkey tail that shrunk. It's <laughs> Anyway, the Bible speaks, Ephesians 6.15, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Blessed, uh, Ephesians 6.15, Proverbs 4.26. Proverbs 19, 2, all of these things. Blessed is he that keeps his foot from doing evil, is the idea of the scripture. Uh, blessed is he that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Look with the feet. Standeth, walks not. Doesn't sit, doesn't walk, doesn't stand, doesn't use his feet in the wrong places. Uh, scripture speaks about those whose feet are swift to run to evil. Uh, in Proverbs 1.16, his feet are swift to shed blood. Uh, that whole thing. So the foot has to do with your, uh, well, let's put it over here, claims walk. There's a neat thing in running I want to give you. You probably know this, but I wanted to give it to you anyway. What we're really looking at is going to the places Christ wants you to go, you know, and to... This has to do with the whole feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Somebody said, if the gospel was narrow, God never would have recommended it for footwear. It's the ability to go... It's one thing to have a hearing heart, a clean conscience, and clean hand. But you've got to go to the place where you're needed. Go into all the world. Uh, Lauren Cunningham has a message called, Go means a change of location. It's weird that we have to be told that. But go does mean a change. It means from one place to somewhere else. And that's, the hard, that's one of the hardest things to do, is, is to go. Go and witness. Go and actually do that thing. Talk, let's, you know, be great to witness. Let's train to witness. But we don't go and witness. We just, let's train to, let's take another course on witnessing. There is a risk. There's a risk in the Christian life. <clears throat> And the neat thing I wanted to give you was this thing. Ah. I have to tell you about. Did I tell you about Eric Liddell? I told you about Chariots of Fire. Did I tell you about the thing with his running? I've got to tell you that. It's the neatest thing. If you've seen Chariots of Fire, it's a story of a young Scottish missionary who was also a great runner. And the, the, the film is about convictions, about people who will not change something even though tremendous pressure is put up against them. In this case, it's Christian convictions. The first time a secular company, I'm known, has done a real Christian movie. Around Jen, the guy isn't freaky, he's not Alma Gantry, he's not Marja Gortner, he's not raping woman on the side. He's just plain, nice Christian guy. He's not weird, he's not spooky, he doesn't go around going, Ooh. he is just an ordinary person that loves God, which is 
totally unusual. And one of the most shocking words in the film was when he said Jesus and meant it. Everybody went, oh, what was that? Oh, it's only Jesus. It was the word, not used as a swear word. It was so powerful. People, what is that? that <laughs> scary thing, see. Anyway, those of you who've seen the film, and they've tried to be faithful, much of the film is faithful to the reality of what it, there's a few things they had to change, but most of the, the actual events were exactly as recorded. When Liddell ran, no coach in the world today would ever coach people to run like him. Because when he ran, he ran normally for a while. And then he went, ran weird. He, he put his head back like that and ran like this. <laughs> See, he, that's how he ran. And, and um, even his friend said he has a peculiar way of running. <laughs> but this, that weird style, it's biography of Sally Magnuson in Flying Scotsman, which is bi his biography said that strange style propelled him to the finishing tape faster than any man in the world. And it wasn't until he did that that he got that kick. And he'd be back sometimes a ridiculous amount. of. In the start of one of the races, he tripped. And this is an international field, a 440-yard race. And going around the first thing, he bumps into this guy and falls off the track. Now, in a field of international class sprinters, you lose a half a second, you've lost the race. He looks up at the judges and they go, you know, keep going. He thinks he's disqualified. But now there's 20 yards between him and the winners and the guys out in front, the guy that, that bumped him. And he takes off. 20 yard start on an international field. And they, they thought, there's no way, but he started gaming. And then his head went back. And he beat the guy. He passed him. And people said they'd never seen anything like it in all of the history of athletics. He'd already run all these races. He collapsed at the end <laughs> and carried him off the field. But they said it was the greatest race they'd ever seen. People had been 30 years back in athletics. One guy watching, he's back 10 or 15 yards. There's, you know, just the final straight left. And a guy says, He'll never make it. And another guy says to him, his head's not back yet. <laughs> Whereupon his head went back and he won. Now they said to him, what is your secret? He said, I run the first part of the race as fast as I can. The second one I run faster with God's help. Mm. Now, here's the thing I want to give you. When the guy who was playing Eric Liddell in the film, first he had to learn how to run properly. Then he had to learn to run Eric Liddell's way. He studied movies of him, and he said, he said, I had a terrible problem running because I couldn't figure out how he knew where he was going. When I tried to run like him, I kept falling, bumping into things and running into stuff. He said, I, I couldn't even see where I was going. He said, I, I, for days I didn't understand. He said, about the third day into filming, learning, trying to run like this, he said, I suddenly cottoned on to what he must have done. He said, in drama school, we used to have what they call trust exercises, where you ran blindfolded, straight at a wall, and you trusted that some of the other school would step out and stop you just before you hit the wall. Or they blindfolded you and stood you on a piano, and you had to, to fall right off the piano. And there was nobody around there when you were blindfolded, and you had to trust that somebody would come up <laughs> and catch you before you hit the ground. They called them trust exercises. See? And he said, I suddenly realized that's how Eric Liddell ran. He literally trusted to get there. He didn't see where he was going. He looked at the sky and he said, I could see how that would, he, ra he just let go and ran utterly relaxed. He said, I could see how that would give him a lot of um, just total freedom in running. But he trusted to get there. Feet. Walk by faith, not by sight. There's a risk in all of the Christian life, but it's the kind of thing that wins races.
Let's close. Father, we thank you for blood on the ear and for blood on the thumb and blood on the foot. We want to be people who you can trust. Help us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Amen.